interesting to be here. It's my first KubeCon. Uh, so my name is Jürgen Brendel. I'm the um, Director of Engineering at Pani Networks. We are the sponsor of the Romana project. And uh, with me here is uh, Stas Greif, one of our uh, top engineers. We've come uh, pretty far today, actually from New Zealand, to uh, talk to you about cloud-native SDNs. So I hope there's something for everyone here. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about a bit. Just we had mentioned in the keynotes, they mentioned already the term cloud native. So we'll, we'll talk a bit about that, what that means to us, and why we think that we need to rethink the networking that we do in our clusters to something that is uh, better suited to the types of applications we're actually building these days. And along the way, we'll talk about some of the new things in Kubernetes. Some of them were mentioned downstairs, uh, upstairs, upstairs, um, uh, that we have to use in order to integrate our stuff with Kubernetes. And we have some demos for you in the end. I do want to talk a little bit about, uh, about our team because it will help you to understand where we're coming from. So um, uh, we have a small team, but pretty much all of us have worked in data center networks uh, or with data center networks for some time. And we've done, some of us have worked in some low level traffic management, working with TCP connections and stuff. So we've been there in that space. And uh, we even had a startup that, believe it or not, that created a layer two overlay uh, network, had a product there like this, and that was eventually bought by Cisco. So we then started working for Cisco, and we saw data center networks again, of course, now in all sorts of scales. But mostly we worked in OpenStack networking. And as you know, OpenStack is not particularly known as being a paragon of simplicity. Um, so we, we, we worked there and talking to people who ran OpenStack networks and operators and people who deploy it and use it, we heard over and over again how complex it was and how they struggled often getting a stable setup going. And that's really when we realized that there, there has to be a, a better way of doing things, a different way of doing things. Um, and because the way we are building applications is changing, we also feel that the time is right for this. And that's why we're here today and talk to you about cloud native networks. So cloud native, what does it mean for us uh, when we talk about networks? Um, it's good to start back a little bit, go back to the past and see how enterprise networks and enterprise uh, applications were built. So one feature of enterprise data centers was that, well, it was yours. It was your data center. So you had full control over everything, the switches, routers, configuration of servers, and such. And therefore, you were able to do whatever you wanted. And applications did, right? They had their hardwired IP addresses. They sent out layer two broadcasts. They did IP address failover. And if you know how that works, that's actually just a hack that you're doing on the network, right? So you could do these hacks and you could get away with because you had full control over everything. Uh, you also had the non-automated mindset of just carefully caring for your server. So you needed things like VM migrations because your servers couldn't go away. All of that added to complexity. And the complexity here is not so much that the network is complex, but the applications using them did whatever they wanted. They used all these corner cases, and that added complexity. And because your applications were free to do whatever they want, they could do anything. Therefore, your network always had to support everything. right? And that is one of the uh, key um, considerations why uh, SDN controllers these days still provide layer two overlays and uh, two domains because that is how you can get this sort of control that those applications need. But we don't do this anymore, don't we? I mean, cloud native applications, when you are deploying pods in Kubernetes, when was the last time you sent out a layer two broadcast packet? Uh, it didn't happen, right? You don't need it. First of all, you, you there's full automation now and you can say about Amazon, whatever you want, if you like them or not, but they surely drove the point home when they told us that EC2 instances can just go away. Don't count on them being around. Everything needs to be automated. They need to come back automatically. They need to scale automatically. And so that's how we learn to build our applications now. We are building our resilience into the application. We don't rely on the, on the network. When, uh, 20 years ago, we worked on, some of our team worked on a load balancer, which worked with kernel modules and TCP connections. And we had customers coming to us saying, no TCP connection must ever fail. So we built a feature, this is crazy, but we built a feature which actually replicated TCP state with every time the sequence number acknowledgement was updated over to, to, an, to another host so that if we failed over, the TCP connection could continue. We don't assume this to be necessary. They wanted to punt off on the network. The network needs to do this for us. We don't do this anymore. 
we don't build applications like this anymore, right? We built this resilience into the application itself now. And as far as the network is concerned, that's really all we want now. Basic IP connectivity, that's all, nothing else, right? No special network. We, we discover our addresses, we don't need to hard code them. No. All right, so what's the problem now with this? Because this this here, that, that should make things simple, shouldn't it? Really should simplify things. But the problem is that what this is what we're trying to do. We're building our cloud native applications, all well and wonderful, on top of SDN controllers and such, which are still giving us this, oh, you want, want to do everything, right? So here, let's have a layer two broadcast thing. And, and how is that implemented? It's mostly implemented, if um, here you can see it, it's mostly implemented by stringing lots of acronyms together, preferably all of them at all times. And then you get this this cake of layers of complexity, and uh, and uh, that becomes brittle, and that becomes certainly not simple. What was simple, our application architecture should have translated into simple networking, shouldn't it? But it it didn't. Right? We we have encapsulate and deencapsulate. Our hardware can't perform natively because we are it can't have proper insight into where things are supposed to go, and it's difficult. Here, let me show you a picture here. This, there. That is wha the path of a packet that goes from a, a virtual instance somewhere, uh, from one layer to domain, through a virtual router in the middle and on the other, right? So you see, you see there, uh, there's encapsulation and bridges and more bridges and more encapsulation, and then goes out and then down the rabbit hole and up again. And even if you have east-west traffic, you still have all of, all of this here. And if any one of these little bits pops here, it's not quite working, not configured right, nothing happens. The package just disappears without a trace. And then you go on a bit big chase and try to find the needle in the haystack, right? Um, this one is a well-known one here. It's the so-called traffic trombone that people have talked about. So here you have two layer two, uh, broadcast domains which are stretching over some hardware and because layer 2, hey, it's all local, isn't it? So stuff gets deployed wherever. But maybe the virtual router between these two mains is in a different data center. So your traffic takes these non-optimal ones. If this would be a fully routed infrastructure, um, the, uh, this connection would have been pretty much direct here, right? But it wasn't. So why, why do we still do this to ourselves? The, we don't need any layer two features anymore, do we? The only thing that we really need them maybe still for is traffic segmentation because layer two domains are actually pretty good for that. You have different tenants in your system, multi-tenancy for example, right? You give one a layer two domain here. That's yours and nobody else gets it. That's your VLAN, yeah, or whatever it is. and and. Fine. And you have the tiers and policies there. You can use these at, as borders to apply policies to your network traffic. If you have multi-tier application, you can have front application backend, right? So you set your policies. So these layer two domains are pretty good for that, but the price you pay is very high, right? What should be simple isn't simple anymore. So we think that there is a solution to this. And we think that the solution is to use a cloud native SDN. And with cloud native here, what we mean is that we only use layer three because that's what our network hardware is really good at and really efficient, leads to efficient path and network. Only use layer three, forget the overlays, we don't do this. Uh, you don't necessarily care about assigning particular IP addresses because our applications, when your pods come up, you get whatever IP address, you just use that, doesn't it? And, um, but we still must provide segmentation and multi-tenancy somehow in the network. You must still support that. So, um, but if you do this, you get this really clear, very native, very direct sort of uh, network setup without mysteries and without hidden sort of magic things that happen. So this is then the project we're working on, which we believe is a cloud native SDN, the project Romana, right? Mostly written in Go and supports Kubernetes and OpenStack. And so we talk a little bit about that. We have, um, we use only IP routing no overlays, obviously, and all the endpoints, pods or VMs or whatnot, they get real IP addresses, which really, really can exist and work in your network. The actual network hardware without any extra configuration can really route these addresses. Uh, so the resulting network configuration on your hosts is beautifully simple. There's hardly anything there. Very, very efficient and fast. It's very thin. Um, the addresses we are using, we're we encoding a couple of things in the IP addresses themselves. You see a few examples of this, such as tenant or segment um, IDs, but also the, the, a, a specific prefix for the hosts on which they run, which allows us to collapse our routing tables dramatically. 
So, and with that, of course, you have uh, uh, better performance and uh, less memory use because you have a smaller routing table to deal with every time you send a packet. And uh, on top of it, these routes are basically static. So when a new endpoint comes up somewhere, nothing has to happen. It's immediately accessible from anywhere in your network. So you don't have to send out some sort of broadcast messages to update everyone else or the other hosts in data. It's immediately there. This is basically how this works. A tiny little cluster, three hosts. You see the hardware addresses up there on top. And we have a bit of agent software running on each of these. So that sets up a gateway interface, 10.0, 10.1, 10.2. And now when we create endpoints, like VMs or pods, they get these sorts of addresses. And if you look, you can see that the prefix here is the same as the prefix of these uh, gateways. So then uh, these are the routing table setting to provide two, two, two routing table entries on each host. So for example, back there, ten, it's jittery for some reason. Um, ten, this basically tells that everyone in here that in order to reach any endpoint on this host, use this gateway interface. And these routes are there, and you can bring up thousands more endpoints here. There's nothing further that needs to be updated on these routes. Really straightforward. Our architecture um, is pretty standard for systems like this. It's a bunch of cooperating microservices. Our root one is our authentication, and that's where you go in. That's one contact point. You get the URLs in a rather restful manner. You can see the URLs of everywhere else we have to go. There's a tenant service, which keeps track of tenants and segments. IPAM, that is where our special IP address assignment, because as you can imagine, we need to manage those carefully. Uh, that where that takes place. And topology keeps track of the all the various hosts in the system. Um, we have agents, as I mentioned, we show the connection to one of them on each host, which can do our things there. And then we have something like Kubernetes, for example. And in order to integrate with that, we have a bunch of integration points of different types. And uh, if you use OpenStack, it's the same thing. These integration points are a little bit different, but it's the same idea, right? These integration points are basically the abstraction layer between us and them. But uh, yeah, so Kubernetes. So this is what we do. This is how we're basically set up. And Stas now is going to talk to us a bit about some of the technical details of these integration points because we're here at KubeCon, and so we thought it might be interesting to talk about uh, how we do this integration and mention some of these new technologies. Okay. Hello, hello. Oh. Okay, so let's talk about Kubernetes. Thank you, Jurgen. Um, okay. So there are two integration points that we use uh, to bridge Ramana to Kubernetes. Uh, first one being CNI container interface. Uh, it's basically a specification devel uh, developed in Coreos, uh, defined as plugin-based network solution for containers, container networks on Linux. Basically, it means uh, you can have different plugins uh, running on same interface, and you can switch them back and forth. Uh, thanks to some Red Hat contribution, uh, this interface supported in Kubernetes since version uh, 1.1, and we are happily using it. Uh, I see some Red Hat here. <laughs> uh, uh, second integration point uh, being mentioned upstairs today is uh, third-party extension, uh, third-party resource extension points. Uh, which allows you to create basically cust introduce custom resource in Kubernetes infrastructure without touching its source code. And custom resource we introducing is uh, network policies, um, a concept under the still under development, uh, but it is a critical part for supporting multi tenancy. And uh, I'll go more about it in details. So. Uh, very very fast around uh, CNI plugin, so it's basically um, executable, uh, living on every host where you have a kubelet. Kubelet is running with uh, some uh, configurations saying uh, how to find your plugin. Each time when a pod created or deleted, uh, kubelet uh, passes this information to plugin with some uh, environment variables and st and the CDI in inputs. Plugin discovers additional metadata uh, needed to make a decision about IP address. Passes this metadata to Ramana. Uh, Ramana does its magic with uh, other services and then makes decision on IP address. IP address gets communicated to CNI plugin. CNI plugin does initial network configuration and passes it forward for Ramana agent 
to finish network configuration and apply any policies if needed. So that's CNI and Ramana in a nutshell. Third party resource. Ah, this one tricky. Uh, how you start working with CNI resource is basically you submit your definition YAML file in you post it into Kubernetes API and uh, what happens next API uh, Kubernetes API provides you with automatically generated URLs uh, one per namespace each URL is a collection of network policy resources in our case you can post to create you can get to list and you can get watch to actually w su subscribe for events for when policies created or deleted ah policies and this is most important thing here so um, there are a number of network backends uh, that trying to bridge to kubernetes Many of them already have multi-tenancy and isolation support and they just need information communicated from Kubernetes to network backend about what this policy need to be. So Kubernetes uh, team community came together to work out uh, ACL rules, semantics of ACL rules, how, it, how they should be. So specifications uh, would be similar for any any network provider so uh, these are still under heavy development there are people here who participate in discussion uh, we just took uh, latest version of this and integrated as a third party resource two key points here uh, first one it was more or less agreed that uh, kubernetes namespace object need to become need to be mapped on tenant on concept of a tenant so it becomes a uh, highest level isolation primitive uh, as far as networking concerned and uh, second point is that isolation need to be backward compatible so anyone who deploys uh, kubernetes with isolation features enabled shouldn't suffer from immediate blackout on a network uh, it need to be opt-in so there is an opt-in flag on a namespace uh, as annotation that makes this enables isolation features in a namespace uh, if you don't define it you don't have isolation yet and everything works as, as expected that which is nice so uh, how do I yeah, I don't know how to make this laser point okay so uh, we have this, uh, that's how network policy looks like right now for us. Uh, first of all, it's a namespace resource. We have a tenant A in the URL. It's a namespace name. Uh, and obviously network policy only applies to pods and uh, yeah, to pods inside this particular namespace if it is isolation has enabled. Uh, network policy is basically a specification for ACL rule. It has uh, two selector, two pods, from pods, and uh, port specification. Basically, ACL rule. It's 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 really important to point out here that the these definitions they this these are this is just an ongoing discussion, right? So th we had we just took took one of the proposals. The syntax may change, the exact semantics may change. We will just implement whatever finally gets agreed on. But we wanted to show something, and so that's why we just said, okay, fine, we will take this, we will go with this, and that's what we've implemented for you to see today. Yeah. Thank you. Jürgen. So uh, another important point here is a segment keyword. So this one we uh, one we using in a selector uh, segment is purely Ramana concept at this point, uh, allowing to introduce lower level isolation primitives that uh, live within a tenant, allowing uh, flexible rules to be defined within a tenant, uh, so you could emulate uh, multi tier project uh, in in a tenant uh, with different access path from front end to back end to database and whatnot. Yeah. Workflow. Uh, how network policy is uh, working with Ramana and Kubernetes? It all starts uh, from submitting uh, definition 
and acquiring URLs from API. Then we use watch capabilities uh, to subscribe on events, on Kubernetes events. Uh, this tiny little program just uh, reads these events and uh, when uh, someone creates new policy, we receive this event, we extract policy definition from this event and pass this to Ramana agent. Ramana agent would uh, translate this policy definition in IP tables rules and apply them on a host, on all hosts, whatever. So fast, simple, that's it. We have demo issue, right? So, demo is scripted, but uh, it all these commands are actually executing right here. It just to save us some typos and time. So, we start with uh, cube small Kubernetes cluster, just two pods, uh, two nodes, uh, no pods as of yet and we're going to create a few pods in default namespace so no isolation just yet like uh, showing that Ramana can work as as usual network backend with no extra features pods created we have their IP addresses uh, IP addresses uh, can kind of tell you some story about where this uh, pod is located uh, these pods, uh, basically front end and back end. What we're going to do is to log into front end and access nginx on back end, which without any policies applied should just work. Yeah, and nginx happy to greet us. Now, interesting th stuff begins. Uh, we will create a new namespace to host our new project, and uh, for this namespace we will define isolation flag opt-in into isolation. So now we do pretty much same trick, creating, uh, what what do we do? Ah, th th that's how uh, pod definition looks like. What's uh, interesting here is, uh, first of all, namespace tenant A, well, it's basically, uh, it's obvious, but segment is important. Segment is important because that's a piece of me metadata that is going to be communicated back to Ramana. That's how we make decision on IP address. And uh, we're going to create pretty much similar pods, but now they are inside isolated namespace. And uh, direct attempt to access from front end to back end is blocked. So uh, that's what we wanted. OK. Um, now we want to actually allow this communication specifically from front end to back end, not vice versa. It's directed graph. Um, that's how our network policy looks like. And yeah, we just posted it, so it's created um, fr from front end to back end uh, on port 80. Let's see if it if we can curl now. Yay! And drinks back. And the next back. So that's that's pretty much all the magic we have right now. So, um, so the if we go back to the uh, one last slide here. So that was thank you, Stas. Um, so that was our demo. So in in conclusion, we just wanna 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 say here that uh, a cloud native architecture can simplify things, but you really should be backing this up. With a more with a network solution that is actually appropriate for the type of architecture that you have, because otherwise you'll just lose all the simplicity benefits. And well, we think that Romana is one of these solutions that can do this for you, because you know we don't we don't make any compromises there. It's very strictly for cloud native application deployments. You get very you get a native network performance. There's nothing, no layer in between. There's uh, the configuration is basically static, very solid sort of configuration you get and it's incredibly easy to work with and understand because you can look at the network config on your host and that's exactly the config you'll deal with um, and it's easy to try if you go to our project 
page, we have um, we have installers. So upstairs they said, oh, it's difficult to bring up a Kubernetes cluster. Well, if you want to, use one of our installers. It's one command that you type, and you can deploy either a Kubernetes or an OpenStack cluster, and you can do so either on local VMs with Vagrant or on AWS. So if you don't want to run Vagrant locally, you can run it on AWS, and you can get Kubernetes or OpenStack. One command, give it a try. It's very easy, and uh, yeah, you can see it in action for yourself. Here are some links how to contact us, and that's it. Thank you very much.